feel his touch. How about you? How good to be in the house of the Lord. Put those hands together and let's love his great name. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Amen. We got a good God. And he's got a great salvation. Oh, yes. And I'm glad we're partakers of that great salvation. Uh, Joe Simon, healing special need. Uh, uh, Sister Susie's friend in California. All right. The doctors don't know what's wrong, but he's real sick. So God can touch him. Sister Pat asks that we pray for Jamie. God to touch her and would move for her. She asked that we would all pray for her. Uh, Jamie did. So let's believe the Lord to touch and minister into her life. Brother Rusty continued healing. And uh, Sister Brenda, God is just working for them. And we're thankful for that. Continue the work. Finish the work. I mean, I believe he's a finisher. Tarver, Mr. Tarver and family for a touch of healing and special need. Plaisance family for healing and special need. Other request. You believe God's looking? Let's raise both those hands and reach out to him in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, what a good God. Thank you for being here in this house. Uh, thank you for ministering to these needs, God. Uh, you know our needs. You said before we call, you'd answer, and while we were yet speaking, you'd hear. Uh, you're a God that knows, you see, and you understand. Uh, you can work, you can move, you will touch these needs. Uh, nothing's too hard and nothing's too small. Thank you for working in the details of our life. Uh, thank you for caring about our cares, oh Lord. Uh, every one of these needs, send healing, uh, send conviction, send deliverance, uh, send your great salvation. Salvation, Lord. In the name of Jesus, let's lift that thanksgiving to the Lord for listening. God, you don't have to, but you do. Thank you. God, thank you for prayer in the confines of your word. For hearing and answering our petitions, oh Lord. We love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. In Jesus' name. While Sister Mandy comes, let's worship our great God. I've got joy like a river.
for salvation, Lord. Ooh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God for security and our salvation. Amen. Make your way to your seats. Prepare to give. This is um, yeah, building fun night. So let's give us unto the Lord from our hearts as we continue to worship the Lord. <coughs> I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the Lord's army. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Soldier in the army of the Lord. If I fight, let me fight in the army, army of the Lord. If I fight, let me fight in the Lord's army. If I fight, let me fight well in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Yeah. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the Lord's army. Soldier in the army of the Lord. Soldier in the army of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your giving. Let's go to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Very, very familiar portion of Scripture. Thank you, instrument players. Philippians, chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, we're going to draw out of this, and then we will be back. Thank God for the Word. I just, it's no secret. I love to brag on the Word of God. The Bible's a big deal in my life. It's a big deal in my life. Now, I have, I have a number of Bibles. I've got a pulpit Bible. I've got a Thompson chain right here that stays right here close. I've got a traveling Bible. I've got, uh, I guess, some that you could call study Bibles. I have electronic Bibles, amen. But I'm just telling you that the, the Word of God is a big deal in my life. It is a privilege to believe it. An absolute greater blessing to teach it and to preach it. I believe in this book. I believe it is God-breathed. That means it's inspired. All scripture is given by the inspiration. That word is breath of God. We have a God-breathed book. I am convinced it's inerrant. It's never wrong. It, it's not even capable of being wrong. It's infallible. It holds no mistakes. Oh, yes. Yes. And I claim it alone, this book alone, as the authority of my life. That's the word of God. The, the psalmist said it. Oh, I, I want to say it as good as he said it. He said, the words of the Lord are pure words. They're like silver that, that is tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times and then he made this statement thou shalt keep them O lord thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever that's why i've got a bible that's why i've got a king james bible because god committed himself to preserve his word everything that's called a bible is not a bible Amen. But God did commit himself to preserve his word to every generation. This generation forever. Psalm 89, 34, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. He's not going to change his word. It's going to be just like it was from the beginning. Psalm 119, 152, concerning thy testimonies, I've known of old, thou hast founded them. How long? How long? 
you, you've established them. You've confirmed them forever. Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It doesn't matter what happens on this world. It doesn't matter what's transpiring or how topsy-turvy this earth is. If you want something solid, just plant your feet in the Word of God. It's settled. It's settled. It's settled. It's not just sometimes settled. It's not it used to be settled. It's not it's going to be settled. It is forever settled. Hallelujah. Psalm 105 and verse 8, he's remembered his covenant. How long? Forever. The Word that he commanded to a thousand generations. Now, if you're not an evolutionist, then you believe, if you can count, according to uh, the scripture, this world's been here about 6,000 years. And if you believe Jesus is soon to come, you understand there's not gonna be a thousand generations. So he just said it again. It's going to be forever. It is going to be continued unto every generation. He's mindful always of his covenant, the the psalmist said, and that is the word that he commanded to a thousand generation. Amen. Well, you know, it's a problem when you find men that do not want to put themselves under the authority of God's word. But that's where I want to be. If I look in this Bible and this world, this word of God says I'm blessed, it doesn't matter what the world says. I'm blessed. If this Bible says I am saved, if I honestly seek it and look at it. See, this is the perfect law of liberty. And when I look in it and I don't look so good, then I'm going to remember what I look like. And I'm not going to try to change the book to fit the man. I'm going to seek to change the man to fit the book because that's what's so very important. If this word says I'm saved, I'm saved. And if this word says I'm not, then I'm not. Amen. Proverbs 4 verse 6, that didn't cost you anything. That's, that was free given there. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now, if you find the word doctor in the Bible, it's not talking about any kind of medical practitioner. It's talking about uh, someone that studies. It's talking about what we would more refer to somebody that has a doctorate. Uh, But if you find the word physician in the Bible, then uh, that that is more in line with, with what we commonly call a doctor. And of course, we also still call them physicians. And uh, most of the time when you find it or a reference to it, there's, there's a negative there. I just have to be honest with you. I've read this book and there is a negative there. Job looked at his buddies that had been sitting there quiet for seven days and not open their mouth. And then when they did open their mouth, Job was thinking, I wish you'd kept it shut. And he said, you're all physicians of no value. God asked the question about Gilead. Is, is, why, why is my people not healed? Is, is there not a physician, a healing person there? And uh, on and on it goes. And, and, and I suppose that the only inference of Christ that... Uh, he is called a physician, and I know we have heard the term. You ever heard the term, the great physician? And I don't know where that would come from, except it come from uh, 
a prophecy that was referred to and Jesus said, there'll, there'll be a day, he told his generation, there'll, there'll be a day that you're going to say unto me, physician, heal thyself. And whatever you've done over here in Capernaum, do right here. And they mocked him on the cross. And they said, you know, you saved others. They were saying, you healed others. But yourself, you can't save. And they mocked him with that. But uh, he is the physician. If there's ever been a healer, he's the healer. If there ever has been one that's had a remedy, he's the remedy giver. Amen. And so with that thought in mind, the great physician, my only physician, has given us a book of prescriptions. They don't have uh, warnings on the label that if you do this, it'll help this, but it'll hurt that. They, they, they don't have negatives that go with it. When God gives a remedy, it is a perfect remedy. And so out of this book of prescriptions... I want to take just a few minutes and talk to you about God's prescription for peace because I live in a world that is without peace. There is no peace, saith God, to the wicked. Not really because I believe the book. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the good word of the Lord. Thank you for the touch of heaven. Thank you for what we feel, for the direction of the Spirit. Lord, we've stepped up to this pulpit to help somebody. Somebody's, oh Lord, under the sound of our voice, uh, are going to be strengthened by your word. You're good people, the good saints of God, the people of God that love you and embrace you. They're found seeking you every day. Lord, you're not second, you're not third. Uh, God, you're the number one thing in our lives. Nothing but nothing can compare compared to you. You're a great God. Talk to our hearts and thank you, Lord, for the promise of peace in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. amen. And you may be seated. Now, I don't want what I'm going to say the next little bit to, to be confused with, with an attitude that God is against. When God said, be careful for nothing, the word, the more common word that we would think about would probably be the word anxious. That's what it is in the Greek, to be anxious. Don't be anxious for anything. But yet at the same time, I, I don't want us to think that God wants his people to have a ho-hum attitude. That's not what he's talking about. And it's not this uh, uh, K sarah sarah Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. That's not exactly right. And there are plenty of things in life that we can make a difference. There are plenty of situations that God doesn't intend us just to take them as they are. If we want it changed, he wants us to work to change it. And so... Somebody said prayer changes things. That, that's been a, a, a good ideology to meditate upon. Prayer does make a difference. Prayer has changed a lot of things. There's a lot of situations that if it had not been for prayer would have been different than they were, but they turned out because somebody believed uh, that all things were possible to him that believed. And so they, they affected those things uh, by prayer. Four verses down from where we read the text, God uh, was there commending being careful. Carefulness was something that uh, Paul said he rejoiced in the Lord greatly when their care of him flourished again, wherein you were also careful. That word means to be mentally disposed, to be earnest in a certain direction, 
to have a concern or an obedience. So God certainly not throwing that out the window. And Paul went on to tell them, I realize the situation was you lacked opportunity. It wasn't your fault that you couldn't be helpful. And it wasn't your fault that for a season and a time, you couldn't be there to, uh, to care about my situation. But when the opportunity presented itself, there you were. And he was praising them for their concern and their obedience uh, and their, their, their being mentally disposed in his direction and of his needs. So don't misunderstand where I'm going. I want to balance this right on the onset. Probably every one of us have at least heard or read sometime or another uh, what has been come, become very famous in our generation, the, the serenity prayer, the prayer of serenity. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time. There's some power in that. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. Taking, as he did, the sinful world as it is and not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will. That I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. And all the church said, amen. So... There is a balance to that, and, and, and I appreciate it. I don't have a clue who wrote that and uh, tried to look at it for a little while today to find out who it was, but, uh, but whoever wrote it, thank God for the truth that's contained in it. So this is a faithful saying, and these things wilt I that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. This is another Greek word comes into our English as careful, but it means again to exercise thought. So please, as I go on from here, do not misunderstand. God doesn't want us to have a careless attitude uh, when it comes to his life and living, serving him, pleasing him, obeying him. Be careful to maintain good works. The devil's out to trip you up. If you're going to worry about something, worry about that. The enemy's out to take you to hell. We've still got an adversary and he's still a devil. And he's still going about. And he's still looking for the weak. And he's looking for the indifferent. Uh, and he's looking for the casual and the careless. And those are the ones he's looking for the stragglers that, that he will get. Let me give you at least one last one. 2 Corinthians seven eleven, As Paul had rebuked and correct the Corinthians in some areas of their lack. And now he's commending them in a later epistle and saying, for behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. And he talks about the real fruits of real repentance, what really transpires. And the first thing out of the box, he says, what carefulness it wrought in you. You know, if somebody has failed God and God in his mercy grants repentance, grants acceptance, God in his mercy reaches out and helps us get up 
It, it ought to be that we make up our mind right then and there. Whatever got me in this situation will never get me there again. Surely I wasn't careful. Surely I got too careless. Uh, I got too casual in what was going on in my life. Or I would never have been in this situation. And then he goes ahead and gives a list of another number of other things that uh, we have absolutely taught on that are fruits of real repentance and real correction in our life. But the first one starts with a carefulness. If we fail God in any point, we need to be careful in that point for the rest of our lives. We were talking about just the other day about conviction and personal conviction and God uses those to build walls and, 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 and guards and so on. And, and, and somebody says, well, if it's sin for one, it's sin for another. Well, and there, there may be some truth to that when you're dealing with the lines and the precepts uh, uh, of the Bible. But, but there are absolutely some things that Jesus told for some that wasn't for everybody. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. Whatever you got to do in your life, in your situation, to take care of those situations, to keep you on fire for God, to keep you right with God, to keep you concerned. And if you're really, really serious about going to heaven, you can't be careless or you will be lost. And you will go to hell. Amen. Jeremiah said this, 17 and 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in Jehovah, and whose hope Jehovah is. For he shall be a tree planted by the waters, that spreads out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat comes, uh, but her leaves shall be green, uh, and shall not be careful. In the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. In other words, there's some, some way in our living for God, in our trusting in God, in our hope in God, in our confidence uh, in God. You know, trust in God. Uh, it's, if, if the only thing that comes to mind is healing, that's an awesome thing. To put your soul and body into the hand of God that paid the price for those things on Calvary. But there are, there are numerous areas of trust that demand certain living out of us and certain expectations that, that, that God has. If you're going to believe me, if you're going to walk with me, if you're going to serve me, it's not just part, it's all. It's not just a little bit. It is everything. So, so this man whose total trust is in the Lord and total hope is in the Lord, uh, God's going to prosper him. And, and he's saying, you do not have to be careful in the year of drought. You know why? He's already careful about some other things. So he's not going to worry about drought destroying his fruit or destroying his future. You remember when Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego stood before the king and the king was talking to them very ferociously and telling them this is going to happen and that's going to happen and it's going to be bad news for you if you don't line up and do what you're being told to do. Well, that would have been all right with one exception. What they were being told to do got them out of line with God. So whatever it takes to stay in line with God no matter what else we get out of line in, we're going to stay in line with God. Are you with me? And so when Shadrach answered for the bunch of them, he said, we're not careful to answer you, king. We, we, didn't, we don't have to study this decision. We made this decision when we were kids. We made this decision when we wouldn't eat the king's meat. We made this decision when we got the word of God that was taught us in our hearts. Thou shalt have no other gods uh, before me. So we're not even careful to answer you. That is not our worry. Amen. So have I told you worry is not found in the Bible? 
But many times, God uses words like fret not. That means don't worry. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Fret not thyself when this comes or that comes or this arises or that, that happens. And then Jesus used a, a terminology that says, take no thought. So these, these words that we're talking about that come to us as careful, a number of them go back to an exercise uh, of the mind. So it just depends in which direction we're going. But what Jesus was saying in, in, the, in the area that he was using there is, don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. I've got that. You take care of this. And when you take care of this, when you worry about this, when you're careful about this, it will alleviate your worries over here. Everybody said God's prescription for peace. Peace is what the world is looking for. Peace is what they can't find it in the bottle. They can't find it in a joint. They can't find it in a needle. They're not finding it. If they did, it wouldn't be destroying their lives. And everybody said yes. So I want us to go back to this prescription. I want us to look at it, but I want to look at what is all around it. So let's back up in the book of Philippians chapter 4. If you still got it open to there. If you don't, you can turn. If you don't want to do that, just listen. But uh, verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord Always rejoice. It means to be full of cheer. It means to be calmly happy. Have I got any happy folks tonight? And again, I say rejoice. This is, this is a double whammy here. You want to you want to know what a work in situate Paul uh, among all folks was in telling them you're not going to have troubles in your life. He wasn't telling them there's not going to be problems stick their head up. In fact, he had told them over and over again, it's going to be like that. One of his messages in the midst of one of his great trials was through much tribulation. If you get get in the kingdom of God, if you you play this thing all the way out, if you get to the end of this race, uh, it's not going to be without a fight. And that was Paul's terminology all the time. Fight the good fight. War a good warfare. And others chime within him, earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, Others were right there saying, yes, if we make it, it's going to be because we give it our best shot. We do everything we can possibly do to go to heaven. So the first thing in this prescription for peace is you need to rejoice. Verse 5 said, let your moderation, everybody say meekness, everybody say humility, everybody say modesty. And, And the word here means with consistency. In other words, it's not something I just do on Sunday. This is not just something I do on a church night. This, this is, is my life. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Jesus said something like that, but he said it like this. Let your light so shine before men. Just be real and let, let men see God in you as real. And then he made this statement that's been much misunderstood. The Lord is at hand. Now, let me tell you what he didn't say. He wasn't saying the second coming of Christ is almost now. He he wasn't saying Jesus is coming. He was saying God's here. God is right here. If it's the happiest time in your life, God's there. If it's the most terrible situation you've ever faced in your life, God's here. So you can rejoice in the fact God's here. You can keep living uh, what you're living with a consistency and steadfastness because God is here. We'll be back to it. And then our text, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, 
supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We got rejoice, we got moderation, and we got prayer. God's prescription for peace. Verse 7, and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Can we take a few minutes just to look at it? Number one, God's prescription. This is what God calls for. This is the great physician. Can you take this pill? Only pill I've got is the gospel pill, so that's, you're just going to have to take this one. Take this pill, and it's praise. That word rejoice, being happy, that's what, that's what we're giving God glory about. You know, I'm saved, and I know that I am. I'm heaven bound and I know that I am. I come back to thank you one more time. This one time leper, I'm still made whole. This one time sinner, I'm still made righteous. Oh yeah, this, this one time individual that didn't know, that didn't have any hope and now I got hope. Uh, so praise uh, is that first step. First uh, Thessalonians five sixteen, Paul said it like this, just two words, uh, rejoice uh, ever more. In other words, how, how much do I need to be joyful all the time? Every day. You know, it's, it's not just a thing. It's an experience. It's a relationship. That's what real praise is. That's what real joy is. It's a relationship. Uh, rejoice evermore. How about this one? Rejoice in the Lord always. So this is what a rejoicing is about. It is in him. It is in what he means to me. It is in what he's done for our life. Uh, it is in what he's accomplished uh, for us. And if we're not satisfied uh, with what he's accomplishing for us, uh, it's because we're not letting him. We're being distracted uh, with something else. Something's bumping him uh, kind of out of the way. You remember the Lord uh, is at hand. He's near. He's close. Uh, in all things, give thanks. Yes. That's praise. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus uh, concerning you. I know we don't give thanks for all things. But we can give thanks in, our th in all things, rejoicing in the Lord, delightful in God. Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope. Woo, hallelujah. If things aren't looking good, look up. That's our hope. If things around you don't seem good, I know we don't like it. We've all been there. Every one of us has been there. None of us are exempt. Situations of this world press on us, but you got to throw those hands up anyway. You got to throw those hands. When you see all these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads. The outlook is bad, the uplook is good. Uh, lift up your head. This is God's remedy. Don't ever be found uh, without a praise in your heart. Uh, don't ever be found without a praise uh, on your lips. His, his praise uh, shall continually be in my mouth, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation continuing instantly, continually, constantly, diligently in prayer. So those things will follow us through the rest of what we're going to talk to you about. Listen to me. God never asked you and God never asked me to do anything that we couldn't do with his help. There's plenty of things we can't do without it. You can save yourself. The Bible says save yourself. But we got to have his help. Amen. This rejoice evermore, this rejoicing in tribulation, this patient in tribulation, this rejoicing in hope. Uh, God said, I'll help you. You put forth the effort. When you get to your limits, God will always be there. You know, I didn't make this up. I didn't write this book. But I'm glad this book was here when I come along. You know where this come from? This, this rejoicing idea in, in every situation, in every circumstance, is having a thankful heart in every situation, in every circumstance. You know where it come from? It came from a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief 
who for the joy that was set before him, in spite of the sorrow, in spite of the grief, uh, in spite of that situation, uh, and if we can, he told us, uh, if we can keep our eyes on him, Keep your eyes on Jesus, looking uh, unto Jesus, that author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and suffered the shame. You talk about a hindrance, a, a, a shame in modesty that Calvary was to him, but praise the Lord with joy. He did it all for me. His sorrow and his grief was worse than mine has or could ever be. Worse than yours has or could ever be. Are you with me? So this, this idea, it's not a man idea. Just, just stopping in the midst of it all when it looks like it's more than you can handle and saying, okay, God, blessed are you. What's the word blessed mean? Happy. Happy are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Matthew 5, 11. Rejoice. Rejoice. Oh, thank you, God. And be exceeding glad. Thank you, God. I don't feel like doing that. Do it anyway. It's his word. Uh, I don't feel like going there. Go there anyway. Uh, it's his word. Uh, it's his prescription. Uh, it's his desire. Uh, it's his truth for you. Be exceeding glad. This is more rejoicing and hope again for great is your reward in heaven. If all you're looking for is what's down here, you're going to have a lot of disappointment. Ooh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, I never did like that song said, build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. No, everything I'm looking for is there. The reward is over there. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they, the prophets which were before you. Number two, not only do we need praise, we need poise. Everybody said meditation. Everybody said moderation. Meekness, humility, modesty with consistency. The Lord is at hand. You know, we can rejoice. We can praise with faith and, and moderation. Moderation has something to do with control. Control in whatever situation. And the reason we can be in control, let me say it again. The Lord is near. He's near watching. He knows what you're going through. He is near helping. And he is near preparing the reward that his faithful people are going to have. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him and to all that call up on him in truth. The end of the great commission, go ye in all the world, do a work for God. We talked about all that the weekend, something to accomplish for God. This, this harvest deal, that's not just the pastor's. This harvest deal is not just a handful of preachers in the church. This harvest deal is the church. It's our responsibility. So th this world that is out there that we can reach, uh, but one of the greatest things about the commission was uh, he let them know much before this, I'm sending you forth in a world uh, and it's the world, but don't fret yourself about the world. There's wolves out there and you're my sheep. But don't fret yourself. I'm just going to warn you that, that the, the work of God, the cause of Christ, uh, it's not the easiest thing in life. But you go at it, uh, and you go at it with a vision, and you go at it with an understanding, uh, and you go at it with a hope, but you don't ever forget this. Lo, I am with you always. 
He just said the same thing that Paul said. The Lord is at hand. Uh, I'm not going to leave you when the heat's on. Uh, I'm not going to leave you when the storm rages. Uh, I'm not going to leave you when everybody else lets you down. Uh, at all times, uh, I'm there. In all things, uh, I'm there. Uh, whatever the situation, uh, he's at hand. You know what it means to be at hand? Uh, he's at hand. Uh, he's at hand to comfort. He's at hand uh, to strengthen. Uh, he doesn't just give us peace. Uh, he is our peace. Uh, let's see how this plays out. So we got praise and we got that consistency of moderation, that poise. And then the last thing we got, and you know this, nobody going to make it without this. We got prayer. Never a more powerful promise ever given than the promises of prayer. Prayers of faith, prayers of consistency, prayers of continuance. You know why? Because prayer, have I told you? I hadn't told you lately, but I've told you that prayer is more than a segment of time. Yeah, prayer is an hour because he said, could not you pray with me one hour? But you know what that one hour does? It, it connects you with something that becomes part of your life all day long. It's more than just a segment of time. Yeah, prayer is a season with the church. Prayer is a season in the closet. Prayer is an opportunity that surpasses all uh, opportunities uh, for a relationship with God. Nothing can do for you what prayer and the word can do for you. So this, this thing of meditation, thou shalt keep him in perfect peace. Now, how do you describe perfect peace? It's the lake, it's the sea without a ripple. Perfect peace. It's, it's the quietness where only the voice of God can come through, that still, small voice that just settles in no matter what the hustle and bustle and noise of the city and the world round about us is. Perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, and here's that word again, because he trusteth in thee. The world sees and trusts in whatever they can trust in. But again, I want to tell you, we see Jesus. When you see me coming, I've got him on my mind. When you see me coming, got him on my mind. How do we pray? First Thessalonians 5, 17, we pray without ceasing. Luke 18, verse 8, uh, verse 1, we pray and not faint. Philippians 4 and verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, this is all a part of our prayer. This is part of our meditation. This is part of our thoughts, our carefulness uh, that causes us to not have to be careful in these other areas that we tried to balance for you a few minutes ago. What sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. This is our meditation. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Two things that's promised right here. Not only will you get the peace of God, but you will also get the God of peace. Psalm 37, 37, mark the perfect man and behold the upright, this complete man, this, this whole man. What does it take to make us complete and whole and to bring about this prescription for peace? It takes praise, poise, and prayer, and it equals perfect peace of God and the God of peace. Somebody's going to come help me right now. The complete man possesses the elements of praise, 
the elements of poise, the elements of prayer. When you put these things together again, it equals the peace of God and a relationship with the God of peace. That man knows, that perfect man, that complete man, that whole man, that man that has exercised himself unto these things in God knows that in the midst of the storm, he's at hand. In the midst of the storm, he'll listen. In the midst of the storm, he can be touched. He's at hand. In the midst of the storm, he will arise. And when he stands up, he'll rebuke the wind. He'll rebuke the sea. And he'll say, peace. Be still. I think one of the great pictures that I've seen, and maybe we've shown it even on our screens, and it was a picture that somebody took and they, they put the caption piece in the midst of the storm. And somebody wrote a song and said, sometimes he calms the storm. And sometimes he just calms me. And that was a picture of that creature, that bird, that nest or whatever it was in the cleft of that rock while the storm was raging without a worry. And without a care because they were in that safe place is your problem too big for you let's stand together just place it in God's hands he's the friend you can ever trust he always understands no doubt and conflict hold your mind and their relentless grip oh cast them out today my friend and know God's companionship. He's at hand. He holds the key to future days. Your life is in his care. He'll never leave you all alone. Your every trial he'll share. Be brave. Go forth unfaltering. Obeying his commands. Don't fret over your problems when you can place them in God's hands. Let me talk to somebody as you're reaching out to the Lord and do reach out to God. Let me talk to you. Don't forget that God has placed himself in the details of your life. There's never a care that's too small that he's not willing to be there that he doesn't understand. There's never one that's too great that his power does not have the capacity to take care of what we cannot. He's in the details of your life, and he so wanted us to know it. The great teacher, the man that, that spake as never man spake, the great preacher, as he stood in his flesh in the days of his flesh, said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Don't worry for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? He's in the details of your life. Behold, look at the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, by worry, can add one cubit to his stature. It doesn't do any good. And why take you thought? Why do you worry for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? I want to be in the details of your life. Therefore, take no thought. Don't worry. Say 
saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek. There's a people that ought to worry. They don't have God. They don't have a promise. They don't have the work of God in their life. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. He's at hand. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put God where he belongs. Put God in his rightful place. Care about the things of God. Let your concern be about the things uh, that please him. Uh, Working hard to satisfy him. And all of these things shall be added unto you. God never lied to you. I'll take care of you. Will you hear him say it one more time? Take therefore no thought, don't worry, for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. You ever heard tomorrow will take care of itself? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, it'll have enough in it. It'll have enough problems there. And there'll be... What is needed to take care of those problems when you get there? So let's just live this day by day. I hope we've told you the balance of this. Let's talk to the Holy Ghost. Somebody, I felt like early in this day, so God let me know somebody needs my prescription for peace. Somebody needs to be reminded. Somebody needs to be told one more time. How great my promise is and how great my care is. You take care of what you can. You take care of what you need to take care of. You take care of what you're lacking in. Uh, You take care of what may keep God uh, away from you and your situation. You take care of the things uh, that God's ordained you take care of. And God's going to take care of you. And God's going to take care of the details. That's what he described. That's what he went through. He was probably talking to a lot more poorer people than than what I'm preaching to today. That we ought to understand and thank God. But he was letting them know, just like he's letting us know right here, right now. I'm in the details of your life. If you'll let me be. If you'll let me have that position. If you'll let me have that place. If you'll let me, through the word and through the promise, have preeminence. If you'll let me, my prescription, praise, poise, and prayer will bring that perfect peace to your life. Let's talk to him all across this house. Let's talk to him. This might be a, a good time, a good opportunity to take that care and really, really cast it on him while faith is at work, while the Word of God is working. This would be a good time. This would be a great opportunity. Cast it on him. Let him have it. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have a throne in my mind. That belongs to the God of peace. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have a place in my heart. That belongs to the God that said, don't worry. Don't let that stay in your mind. Take no thought. Give that to me. Let me be in the details of your life. Balance this in our hearts. Lift that praise to him, saints of God. Lift it all across this house. Thank you, Lord. And God of peace, as you settle among us and you rise from within us, let your peace cover us. Peace like a river.
Let's sing it one more time. Let's do it, Jesus. It's working. You're leaving, child of God, with a different frame of mind tonight than what you came with. It's yours. God gives it to you. He's at hand. Let's do our prayers right now. Father, we're joining together. We're binding together. We're united in this effort because it's God ordained. Our world needs laborers, and that's our prayer. Send them, God. Send them, Holy Ghost. Work your work. We need your help to accomplish your purpose, to be counted worthy, Lord, uh, to be answerable to you, Jesus. Help us, God. To fulfill your purpose as you touch, touch round about us, touch our community. Visit in a mighty way. Grant us that revival. Thank you for the work that you're working. Thank you for that mighty visitation. Touch our state, our nation, Lord. America needs you. You're working. We're watching it, God. We're seeing those things that are nothing less than your hand and an answer to prayers of faithful intercessors that you're raising up for this end time. God, you touch our world. You bless our missionaries. You bless those that carry this apostolic truth. They didn't have to, God. Those that have given up so much and yielded so much of their life and their comfort for a soul and for the needs of this hour. Give them a harvest, God. Bless their labor. In Jesus' name.